Uh, hi, welcome to Politics for Bitches Who... No. Bourbon and Politics Bitches... We don't know. We don't, we don't know what it's called, but this is the Politics for People Who Hate Politics Bourbon and Bitches Crossover Spectacular, which may be wildly overselling the point, but I think it's going to be pretty good. Um, and I'm going to be lazy and sit back and say, panel, introduce thyself. <laughs> Ah, uh, you said you were making the introductions. No, I didn't. <laughs> All right. All right, fine. I heard okay. you say that. Okay, well, I... Said it, but... <laughs> it was opposite day. It's opposite day. It's fine. I think we can introduce ourselves. Um, I am Meg Gilliland. Um, I do social stuff for Voice and Exit. Um, yeah. There we go. <laughs> and what are you drinking? Because let's, let's, let's hold this. Really, really right shitty now. red wine. Like, this nice. is terrible. It's so gross. <laughs> this is a mistake. <laughs> Horrible mistake. Yes. Good. And other lady, other bitch, that sounds wrong. Oh, no, I don't mind it. That. <laughs> I mean, I actually put in my title, Bad Bitch, but it's not showing up. It's just saying Tiffany Madison, so that's Because that's implied. Thing. That's implied. And it's, Google just, it, Google gets me. That's all. Uh, <laughs> Tiffany Madison, I do a lot of things. Um, working with Queen Congress Amsterdam, still doing a little consulting with Liberty Me. Um, I actually am pursuing other really exciting opportunities this year, writing for the Libertarian Republic, which is Lucy's favorite, favorite publication by the, <laughs> by the one and only Austin <laughs> Peterson. Someone I thought we were going to mention that name. Someone that we're definitely going to sacrifice to the whiskey gods tonight, right? Mm. Fire um, goddess. Volcano <laughs> goddess. We'll, we'll, we'll work out the kids. Something. Something. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm unfortunately drinking ginger ale and rum, because that's all we have in this house right now. We are, I'm not opening it. Worse, a, yeah, well, we've got like 18 year, 12 year Jameson and Glenn Fittich, and I'm not opening that. So, so your standards are higher than mine. I'm getting I'm slumming today. <laughs> I'm slumming, so. Fair enough. Cheers. <laughs> Who else do we have? Who's our honorary bitch today? Uh, Joe Staggerwald, honorary <laughs> bitch. I'm here by the grace of nepotism. Because I'm kind of ism. an occasional, always co host of, not co host, guest of politics for people who hate politics. And I am <laughs> drinking gin and tonic. Okay. Man, they're Keep they're that malaria drink. away. Lucy, we need to know what you're drinking. Oh, um, I poured some whiskey into this coffee because I needed both uppers and downers. And nice. Here it That's is. That's respectable. Mm hmm. <laughs> Also, you have to eat owls. The coffee's so. like two weeks old. No, two days old. <laughs> um, okay, so we're, we're going to do this thing. I was feeling pessimistic today. Got writer's block. I was um, kind of a dick to Matt Welsh on Twitter. And I that saw was that. Awkward. Yeah, that was really <laughs> uncomfortable. Sorry about that, Matt Welsh. Um, so, like, a general cumulative, like, pessimism. And, you know, the, 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 the dickishness, though, my bad, was also it has a whisper of libertarian sectarianism at its heart. So everything seems pessimistic. Everyone hates other libertarians. Occasionally libertarians admit to being, like, child molesters on Facebook, and then other libertarians think somehow blame that on left libertarianism. And more and more people, to me it seems, this is, like, purely anecdotal, like, they seem like they're like, oh, I can't stand the movement anymore, and I don't want to be called a libertarian because you're all embarrassing human beings. And I figured we needed to counteract that, like, you know, with a spirit of Jeff Tucker-esque, like, let's be optimistic, you bitches. So I was hoping you guys could help me with that today. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a perpetual <laughs> optimist. I have seen... Um, really, really uh, hardcore survivors of very significant trauma in their life take the world by the balls and can constantly maintain a very, very positive attitude about pretty much everything um, because of what they've been through. So it's really hard for me to get negative about things um, unless they're very, you know, like, unless it's like war, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the movement, I think sometimes we all get a little bit wrapped up in defining the movement as this like one ecosystem that has a little echo chamber around it and it's mostly on Facebook or within the circles that you know all of us kind of frequently travel because it's a small and incestuous community right 
But mm -hmm. I've learned um, with these new opportunities I've been looking um, for and all the individuals that I met even through Liberty Me, which come from every country in the world, all different backgrounds, demographics, political views. There's a lot of people that compromise silos of the movement that don't know each other and are out there creating businesses and jobs and innovating and disruptive technology and you know the the Bitcoin entrepreneurs and um, you know people that are are just spiritual libertarians. They're not even really members of the movement. Are out there moving and shaking and getting things done. And it's very optimistic to me to see that energy and that drive to create and innovate things instead of just having debates on Facebook. Um, so to me, it's I, I try to avoid getting into really, really um, you know crappy situations and, and paying attention to a lot of the petty shit that goes on because there's so much awesome out there. So Lucy, you need to come hang out with me and, and my my new friends and all these crazy circles and awesome individuals that I'm meeting because, yeah, the rest of the, the movement can suck the life out of you otherwise. Well, that's, the, that's to me, though, and this is definitely just my personal experience, like, it's simultaneously the most awesome thing in the world to have this, a bit of a go-to group in spite of the embarrassing sectar sectarianism. Um, but at the same time, it, 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 like any other subgroup of anything, I think it has this horrible other side to it. Like the stories I hear from um, my lefty anarchist cousin about just like East Bay, California, you know, black hoodie clad type of anarchists, like it sounds at least as bad. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's like it's like the best and the worst thing, I guess, to me. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's tough to it is tough to stay super positive when you have a lot of infighting and you know bitchiness and cattiness, I guess you'd say, um, in between these very different groups. So yeah, I, I don't know. I try to stay away from it because there's like I said, there's so much good out there. Focusing on that, I mean, I sound like a freaking naive Pollyanna right now, but <laughs> focusing on the positive to me is really really powerful. And I, I appreciate the energy from people that are always focusing on the positive, too. So we just feed off of each other. Mm -hmm. And that, that helps me kick the, the childish nonsense out of my head. That's good. Yeah. Go into your zen place, Lucy. <laughs> zen. Yeah, I definitely have to agree with Tiffany on that. Like, who is, by the way, seriously one of the most consistently positive people I've ever met. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I like to kind of stay away from the infighting because it's stupid and counterproductive, in my opinion, um, and focus on the positive aspects of the movement and then kind of expand beyond the libertarian movement yeah. and look at what's happening really in the tech space and with innovation and disruption because... To me, that's where, like, the future is. <laughs> um, and the easier we make it to work around the state, like, as soon as it becomes easier in any area to ignore the state and to use innovative technology to do what you got to do, then people are just going to start ignoring the state, and it's going to become obsolete over time. Um, so I really like to ignore the infighting because it just gets me down and it's stupid and they're children. <laughs> <laughs> yep, right on. You gotta agree with that. Do we cheer you up, Lucy? I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I think a lot of the. the sorry. Um, go on, go on, guest bitch. Thank you. <laughs> I think a lot of the you know the problem comes seems to come from the social media wars that you know seem to consume all political. You know, but libertarians segment. were in fighting and shooting themselves in the foot years before social media. I mean, I mean they, they all, plenty of years of it. Okay, I so here's, all, here's the case. Sorry. I, <laughs> I think all political groups do it. I think libertarians, you know, in general are a little more, you know, it's less about the party, which kind of saves, I think, the Republicans and the Democrats a lot because eventually they kind of just suck it up and, you know, vote for whoever and kind of keep the party machinery rolling. The libertarians, you know, we maybe they have the principles to kind of, you know, continue their segmentation and kind of stay within their own groups. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they'll probably never win anything. So <laughs> I think 
I think they can afford to be a little more, you know, a little bit more um, definite in their beliefs. And, you know, the media echo chamber on Twitter and the sniping and stuff definitely doesn't help. And I know, Lucy, you're kind of right in the middle of that, and I think that's unhealthy in a lot of cases. <laughs> it's just is. back and forth, and it's just constant. And I think that exaggerates, you know, the problems in libertarianism where I think on the margins and the technology and, you know, not within the center, I think, is where the, the real progress is being made. The thing about the technology stuff is I've come to realize that, like, every once in a while I'm convinced I have to delete Facebook and even Twitter starts to grate. Um, <laughs> and I somehow convince myself that if I just get rid of social media, so, like, there'll be these vast improvements in, I don't know, what I'm getting done and what I'll be. But at the end of the day, and this is goes out to all the Luddites out there, technology is exactly the same as socializing to me almost at this point, in that some days you're going to do it and you're going to do great and you're going to have these great conversations and you're going to be so happy you know all these different people. And some days you're going to go on Twitter or Facebook and you're just going to be like, who the fuck are these people? God, I want to go <laughs> to my bed and like leave me alone. But it's the... It's a, that to me, it's a completely, it's almost the exact same reaction that I get to real life socialization, which almost suggests it is, it's now officially the same damn thing, even as people still, you know, try to pull the, but the internet isn't real card, which I always Wait, who tries to pull that card? People I don't still know these people. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally they still do that, like, and I, that's, that's such a bizarre argument, because, okay. I don't know. That's weird. All right, so this is like... This is just one little thing that I learned this week, and this is this just makes me happy. So maybe this will make you happy. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I was listening to the Tim Ferriss show, his podcast, because I love it, and he had Peter Diamandis on there, and then they got to talking about Elon Musk and like Elon Musk as a person. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that they mentioned was that like. Um, in 2008 or something, like, not that long ago, like, pretty recently, both Tesla and SpaceX were on the verge of bankruptcy. And now SpaceX is valued at $10 billion and has, like, a massive <laughs> infusion of cash from Google and other yeah. places. So, like, to me, that's just, like, an amazing example of, like, Elon Musk is doing fucking crazy things. And just thinking way, way beyond what the vast majority of people are even capable of conceptualizing. Mm -hmm. And he's gone from about to lose his companies to we're going to put the internet in space <laughs> in a very, very short amount of time. And I think that that's beautiful. And, like, that's where I think the future is. And, yeah, I don't know. That makes me happy. That gets rid of my pessimism a little yeah. bit. Epic privatized space travel does sound awfully good. Oh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> I want to go. <laughs> I, wanna I, don't know. go. I don't know that I do, but I want others to go and to tweet about it, and then I'll retweet okay. them. All right, well, Tiffany and I will go. We'll tweet to you from space, and then you can retweet us. <laughs> I'll do it. It'll be great. <laughs> so how do we know that – well, I mean, I, I like – the spiritual libertarian, I believe Tif Tiffany just said. I that's the perfect term for the type of person who doesn't know they're libertarian, but basically is, because they're just very not interested in devoting time to forcing others to do things, and they just want to do their own thing. Mm -hmm. um, and secretly, we would all probably have less stress if we just did that and didn't actually try to change anything, you know, mm -hmm. because the government's really big and all, and it's a real bummer. But I guess the, the, the tech optimism thing to me that was always like um, there's almost this assumption that that we can beat sort of the the the, uh, the tech takes one step towards being awesome and the government you know races to catch up and and to spy on certain things and other things like how do we know Meg <laughs> that we'll beat him in the end with our Elon Musk and our I don't know tour maybe I don't know. <laughs> well like it's it's a little bit difficult to say right now because and perhaps I am being a little bit overly optimistic but I don't think so but I think it's difficult to say because like 15 years ago people still looked at the internet which was the world wide web <laughs> um as 
kind of like magic. And now we just like completely take it for granted. And even the libertarian movement has grown so rapidly because of the internet. So, like, it's hard to say. Like, we're still kind of in the infancy, I think, of the information technology age. Um, but I just kind of look at what's happening and the internet and Bitcoin and totally disruptive things. And to me, we're moving in a really positive direction. That sounds good. I, I, like I don't think the state can compete. Um, the state is is so slow and... <laughs> So, I mean, I mean, they can't even do their own basic functions properly in a timely yeah. manner. And the, the faster society gets accustomed to moving at breakneck speeds into communication, the more irrelevant they become. And the more irrelevant they become, the less power and control they have. Um, that seems to me like the best type of revolution to have because it's peaceful and innovative. Markets and and actual technology innovation, technological innovation, you know, take over where the state can't supply. I mean, it's it's really interesting to see how all these different industries have developed over the last 10, 15 years. Even um, it's amazing. You've got, I mean, just imagine the iPhone 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the state is not keeping pace. <laughs> yeah. So, ten, you know, ten years ago. We, I'm assuming we all were, at least I was. We were on MySpace, okay? Ten years ago, MySpace was the place to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, that, that's kind of really, really fast change. Are we just laughing at MySpace now? Are we just taking a moment to laugh at MySpace? Cause... Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. MySpace is one of the places where I started, like, learning how to code, though, so. Well, there you go. <laughs> I think right. that page pretty. <laughs> Think of something like Uber, which basically, you know, operated illegally outside of government <laughs> control until it built up enough people, you know, and eventually, you know, the government just couldn't do anything about it. It was too popular, it was too necessary, it was too innovative, and it was too disruptive, and it kind of just, you know, it evolved from an illegal operation into, you know, this massively successful company. Pretty much just by saying, you know, screw it, we're just going to do it, the government can't stop us. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like, in the startup space, like, what do people say? Well, we want to be the next Uber of whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> in very, very short amount of time. And I mean, even Zappos is about to um, implement Uber-like surge pay for their customer uh, support workers. The shoe website? Zappos? Yeah. The shoe website? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Compare, comparing Uber and shoes. Uber for shoes. Bring me shoes. <laughs> yeah, shoes. Kind of, it's, it's the Uber of customer support at Zappos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of thing. You know, the government, like what Tiffany said, the government just cannot keep up with you know public innovation. Yeah. You know, cap market and capitalism kind of... You know, they can just go around government in a lot of cases, and the government Does, will be able to keep up, and eventually they'll just give up, probably. But is that going to work in everything, though? I mean, with Uber, is very, it's very obvious, because that's a pure market. It's a pure lack. Like, you know, like Pittsburgh. I don't know if, Joe, if you have ever, ever tried to call a cab in Pittsburgh. I lived on, you know... I, I was part of the scene, all right? I know about cabs. You know about the <laughs> or lack thereof. I mean... Yes. They it was impossible to get cabs. They will not come pick you, me up, me and my friends up at our nice neighborhood, private, you know, like nice college, like the, much less people. People, in, you know, there's a reason that in the in the poorer neighborhoods in Pittsburgh, there was a ton of jitneys, and there have been for years and years and years because the cabs would never come to those neighborhoods. They basically go to the airport, and that's all. And I don't know, you know, I'm sure Uber can s slip up you know, from time to time, but there was just such an incredible lack in Pittsburgh that I know firsthand, just seeing the lack, that you just have to be excited about that because it's it's just such it's such justice, I guess, to have Uber and Lyft now as well in Pittsburgh. And it shows that, you know, markets, I think it shows to the common people that markets do, you know, function well and in situations where there's, you know, government rationing of something, 
you know, it's all kind of chipping away, I think, at the, the facade of big government. I hope yeah. so, yeah. Even, you know, with the, the, the price surging being so controversial, which I think is absurd. People people get over it. Even, like, you know, and just anecdotally, like, you read, like, Jezebel or, or the worst tech website in the world, Valley Wag, you see these authors trying to skewer Uber, and then you see, scan the comments full of, you know, the type of people who comment on Gawker, which is n enough said, most of those people even will be like, well, you know, I needed a, you know, Hooper was really helpful, or like, you know, that city doesn't have cabs. Uh, like, the ideology is no match for the fact that they want to be able to get somewhere, which is so awesome. So, I have to, are, are you guys familiar with the Twitter account Startup L. Jackson? No. <laughs> well, you should follow it, because it's hilarious. So, it's someone in Silicon Valley, um, I think they've been running, like, um, analysis programs to, like, figure out who it is, and they've kind of narrowed it down, like, who's actually running this account. Yeah. But, um, so, the other day, Startup L. Jackson tweeted, all I'm saying is that if I lived in New York and I were dying of exposure in a blizzard, cap surge prices would be to blame, <laughs> which I thought was really hilarious. It's true. They would be. <laughs> they would so be. So true. <laughs> which, unfortunately, I think the impact of Places like Valley Wag and Pando have literally no impact on the, the normal person. Like no one cares what they say about Uber. Uber is so far beyond, you know, their slings and arrows that it doesn't even matter. I hope so. Yeah. Great. They're they're terrible. I fucking love Uber. I take no, Uber anywhere I'm at. You know how many people I've told about Uber that had never heard of it before? I'm like, oh my god, you have to see this app, and I literally should get fucking kickbacks from them <laughs> for how many people I've evangelized this to, opened up my app, showed them how amazing it is, and they're like, oh my god, I didn't even know this existed. I'm like, yeah, yeah this is amazing. But it is Clarksville. This is a small town, kind of. <laughs> so it's but in Nashville. They have it in Nashville. Anytime I travel, anywhere I go, I'm looking for Uber. And it's great. It's phenomenal. I've never had a bad experience. Yeah, me yeah. neither. I, I love Uber. In my town, so... I live in a super, super status area. <laughs> what area is not that? But well, <laughs> okay. So, like, I, I live in, well, Carborough, which Chapel Hill and Carborough are basically, like, the same. Like, they were separate at some point, but now you're, like, driving down Main Street or Franklin Street, which is, like, the Main Street in Chapel Hill, and they just, they converge. Like, there, there's no difference, really. Carborough has more hippies and lesbians. That's about the only difference. Okay. <laughs> um, I've heard but that they flock to North Carolina. I've actually heard that. They they do, especially Carver. <laughs> I see more lesbian couples, I think, walking down the street, like, holding hands or with their kids or whatever than straight couples. Like, no joke. <laughs> um, but, like, Chapel Hill is so status. And since, like, the 70s or something, maybe earlier than that, its nickname is Commie Hill. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, like, it's a, it's a super safe area. And we have this completely absurd law for taxis so like no matter how far you're going it's something like a minimum of eight dollars um so you could you could literally go one block and they're still going to charge you eight dollars yeah wow um, yeah um so i did not take cabs in chapel hill but now that there's uber and i'm going out i'm like well let's call uber not call uber but let's get an uber <laughs> I mean, it should be everywhere. I'm a big, um, I like to go out and drink, believe it or not, and raise a ruckus. <laughs> and no I, like to, I know. I mean, I don't, I don't go out much, you know, very often because I'm a workaholic. But when I do, on a Friday or Saturday night, I mean, my husband's active duty military, um, God rest him in his, uh, in his love of the state, right? But um, <laughs> he's, a, he's a secret libertarian that's slowly converting to anarchy. <laughs> Fingers crossed, maybe. Anyway, um, uh, you allowed to say that? Yeah, yeah, I did. I like to, no, so so side note, really quick before I say this, um, Matt has my husband Matt has gone with me to several libertarian conventions and events and um, ISFLC and several other little meetups. And uh, he always, you know, he is an individual, so he doesn't ever tell anyone he's in the military. And almost every single time that he's gone to one of these conventions. Somehow, some way, they start talking about statism. Wow, isn't that weird? And um, it's this, you know, well, 
he and then he starts to slowly troll people. Well, what do you think about the military and da 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 da. <laughs> and uh, he actually has been really surprised by quite a few. Um, I'm gonna be a little bitchy here, but neck bearded, you know, guys <laughs> that haven't done a push up in ten years basically say, well, I have guns, so I don't need the military. And he's like, wow. So that's the anarchist position is you personally have guns. So, And he believes it should be disbanded and that only a National Guard should be established. And so that's why we're slowly getting... We can work with that. We can definitely work with that. Yeah, he, he, he does. So that's pretty much his view. So that now that the world knows. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, he slowly starts to, to troll them. And then he pulls up a fake gun and shoots him in the face. And he's like, what prevented me from doing that right now? Like, you can't physically stop me. I am bigger than you, and I have more guns than you. I guarantee you that. So you're, he can't make that intellectual switch to anarchy because there's force and force, and the guy with the bigger guns is always going to win out over the guy with less guns in his world. And that's from serving in really brutal, awful places like Iraq and Afghanistan. He's going back for his fourth deployment in two months. So he's like, look, the way the world works over there is kind of a form of anarchy without any order, the opposite, obviously, of what the true philosophical term of it is. So he can't ever, no, no libertarian has been able to actually persuade him that it's something that's actually viable in a truly violent world. So anyway, side note, Lucy, that's a task for you. <laughs> But um, um, he so every time we go out, we, we go and, and raise a ruckus with uh, you know his fellow soldiers who are all hardcore constitutionalists, not not Republicans. They're very libertarian actually, mm -hmm. and um, libertarian light, I guess you'd say. Anyway, we go and hang out with them, and it's a shit show. We're out till four or five o'clock in the morning, just getting crazy, of course. And I drink them all under the table because I'm Irish and Italian. <laughs> so when we go out there and I can't literally find a cab in this small town, no one knows what Uber is. That was the whole point of this, by the way. And it's <laughs> extremely frustrating because when you go to Nashville, it's 10 minutes, 5 minutes. So last time we had to walk home because there was I refuse to ever drive under the influence. It's the most ridiculous thing you could ever do. I'm like a freaking tyrant about it. So yeah, I mean, people will drive drunk because there is no competition in this area. So anytime I have the opportunity at all whatsoever, I always support Uber. I haven't gone to Lyft yet, but I just want to give them as much money as possible so they can expand into every area that they can possibly service in order to prevent people from driving drunk or walking in the cold when they've had too much to drink in heels. Thank you very much. <laughs> So yeah, it's uh, even if I even if it's easier to call a cab or cabs right there, I will actually physically inconvenience myself specifically to give them my business. Yeah, I mean they they not that every damn you know individual cab driver deserves it, but the big ones like Yellow Cab, like they deserve to go down in flames as a company. <laughs> I'm sorry, like I will like I will be sorry about certain people's livelihoods, but they deserve it so much so because they were so not doing their basic job which was to provide a service to their customers um, yeah they're awful they're they're just I mean, awful. honestly dc was a novelty to me because you could hail a cab which is not something i'd ever done in pittsburgh again like so i i haven't even gotten to the uber state of of novelty i'm just like it oh like there are actually you know vehicles you can pay money to take you somewhere <laughs> so i'm still stuck on cabs but i'll, I'll get to uber soon enough that will be good. And we have, I mean, there, there are other awesome things too, though. Like, there's like Airbnb. Um, Uber there's, for apartments. <laughs> there's um, those like illicit dinner parties for pay that New York was doing. And then there was this oh, amazing yeah, really media cool. report. There was a media report about like, and there, it was like undercover, like, they're having illegal dinner parties. And <laughs> like, I remember scanning the comments of this. It was like a, a New York affiliate um, television news station every single comment was like what the hell is this like <laughs> this is not an undercover secret operation worthy story like you guys are insane every time i see that kind of thing it makes me optimistic too because even the ideological people who somehow in theory think that they disapprove of some of this stuff you know they can't find a hotel somewhere can't find a ride somewhere they are going to call these places they're so... going to use these websites do you guys actually, like, do you know how Airbnb started? Because this is one of my favorite startup stories. Okay, it's kind of hilarious. So these guys, like, they're in San Francisco, and they're all, you know, very young guys. Like, we want to start a startup. 
So, like, that was their whole thing, and they're sitting there trying to figure, all right, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? They have an apartment, and they're like, well, fuck, we can't pay rent this month. But there's this mm -hmm. big conference coming into town. We've got extra space. So they rented out air mattresses <laughs> in their apartment. Yes. And they could pay rent. And then they're like, wait. <laughs> market for this. <laughs> yes, there is. And enough Airbnb service. was born. <laughs> Which I think is actually, like, that's one of my favorite startup stories, and I think it's really beautiful because they seriously just responded to the market. Like, all of the hotels in the area were booked up, mm -hmm. so they had extra space. And they needed to pay rent. Airbnb. <laughs> that's awesome. It's a mutual thing where, you know, the markets are bringing together the, the people who need money and who need a place to stay. And like, I mean, it's so obvious. And, exchange good money for goods and services, and it's I mean, amazing. This is crazy, talk, Lucy. <laughs> Why would you allow that? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess if we call it the sharing economy, that'll shut the liberals up enough to not object yes. as well. Yes. <laughs> Guys, it's the sharing, the sharing economy. economy. You have to love it. It's it the sharing. Good. Yeah. It sounds good, yeah. <laughs> well, now that we've solved transportation and lodging um, communication let's move on to slightly trickier things like can we find optimism in let's say well drug war stuff there's a definite change, well, wind see, change in the past five years there's this beautiful little thing called the Silk Road where you <laughs> go on the secret <laughs> interwebs allegedly allegedly, there allegedly, <laughs> allegedly you can go on the secret interwebs and allegedly you can buy drugs. <laughs> a lot of drugs. And if you're a like, robot, you'll get arrested. That are, like, reviewed. At, like, the sellers are reviewed. And, like, the drugs so are reviewed. And, like, there's their market checks on, like, the suppliers. It's I don't know. It's crazy. If the alleged founder hadn't <laughs> allegedly tried to put a hit on, on, on a lot of people, he would be a hero, honestly. But that did <laughs> allegedly happen. So that's allegedly, allegedly bad. <laughs> but allegedly... It's someone else's fault. Because well, he is not the OG DPR. The what now? Allegedly. <laughs> well, that's... Ross Albrecht is allegedly not the OG DPR. He is OG. I don't know. I've had too much to drink already. I don't know what you're saying. Allegedly. Doing. Explain it to the people. It's allegedly not his fault. I don't okay. know. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. That then. trial is hilarious, though. Like, if is it? But dude, <laughs> no, seriously, they, um, they're they're doing some stuff. The defense is doing some stuff, <laughs> and they're making the prosecution look like fucking idiots. I haven't paid attention, but I did enjoy that. What is it like? It's like Liberty Fest or something. One of the speakers is his mom, and it's like mother of alleged Silk Road founder. I was like, <laughs> what? How are you gonna give a speech? I mean, that you're just gonna give a speech full of allegedly, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so I have to point out this little thing. Um, <laughs> so I'm working with Voice and Exit, which is like this awesome festival of the future um, in Austin. Mm. Um, and so one of the co-founders, Max Borders, um, his, name who, is funny. I, his name is awesome, who is based in Austin where Ross Albrecht went to school. Um, mm -hmm. So... Allegedly. There, yeah, allegedly. He allegedly went to school in Austin. Um, there was a screenshot of, like, some of his files with, like, his aliases, and one of his aliases was Max Borders. That's <laughs> and awesome. he knew of Max Borders. And, like, yeah. So I think that's hilarious. <laughs> I wonder how Max Borders feels about that's that. Awesome. Hopefully good. He posted about it on Facebook, so you can go check it out. I'm actually a Silk Road virgin. I've never been. I've never done anything on there. I probably should check it out. I have never been. I did last Students for Liberty. I did shush some people up or told them to, you know, be more vague in their conversation because they had been there and other things. And I was like, guys, we have smartphones sitting right next to us. Like, yeah. just, 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 just in case. <laughs> Of course, I am the worst. Like, I have phone conversations with my with my anarchist cousin, and I'm. It always comes down to like, man, the government's terrible. 
and like Waco is bad and <laughs> police are bad. I'm just like anything possible to just make sure that someone is listening. We talk about it, so that's good. <laughs> <sighs> All right, so we yep. good. We so, we've solved the war on drugs, right, Joe? <laughs> yes. Yes. The Silk, yes. The Silk Road has solved the war on drugs, or something. But we what haven't was... solved what, Joe? I was gonna say, what was the point of all this again? <laughs> oh, optimism. We're just solving problems, yeah. optimistically. Yeah. What's next? Allegedly solving problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what is next? I mean. I mean like the general state of the the world. That's the war, not, the war not, stuff. The war stuff's a doozy. Um, drones are bad because they make no. You know, no, no. Wait, wait. wait drones we'll are not through. bad because Amazon is going to use drones to deliver things to me in thirty minutes. I'm cool with drones. <laughs> not cool with the state using drones. <laughs> it's true, actually. I I pissed off many an anti-war commentator by by actually repeatedly making this argument. <laughs> if only for the fact that like the state is not gonna get rid of their drones, so the solution is not to stop Amazon.com from having drones. The solution is, well, I guess we all have drones and we drone it out. The problem with drones drone it out, bro. <laughs> as a technology, obviously, is that you can just have this sort of constant horrible presence in foreign countries you shouldn't be in. But besides that, is there any reason to be at all optimistic about war stuff, or is it just sort of like an ebb and flow thing? Like we're not, at, you know, we're not having a, a a total boots on the ground war anywhere like this minute, but you know, in three months we could be. Or is there any is there anything in that area to be optimistic about? Um, well, we're not in Iran yet. <laughs> That's good. It's true. Good um, <laughs> yeah, you know, guys like, uh, you know, my husband's deploying to Afghanistan, and he'll be, um, instead of flying in the really remote areas, the really, really shitty places, where, um, you know, they have a lot of kinetic activity, fingers crossed, it will be kind of receded back to the actual American bases, so it's just a, I think, I don't even remember what they're calling it now, like Operation Resolute Protection or something like that now. Um, so, you know, the, when, when the war was more expansive in Afghanistan, you had a ton of little outposts all over the Koner Valley and all over the Helmand province, and people were being slaughtered on both sides because there were little outposts where the locals were fighting directly. Now those little kinetic areas, unfortunately, it was all for naught, have fallen back to radicals, but you have less kinetic activity in those specific areas there. Um, now it's focused into one area, and people who would otherwise be incentivized to leave their home and go all the way, um, you know, just to fight in their own backyard, now have a long way to travel. So they're under the thumb of radicals, and it's an awful situation, but there's less kinetic activity down in those areas than there were five, six, seven, ten years ago, really. So that's to me is a disgusting situation that's still a teeny tiny slight positive. Um, but that's all I've got for Afghanistan. Otherwise, it's just a, a clusterfuck yeah. all around. I mean, I, mean, I know there are. I was gonna say I know there are wars. You know, there's pretty much been a war every year of human history. Well, probably. I don't know. I don't have the actual numbers on me, but <laughs> you know, the global trends. Throughout history, I mean, there's less. I believe I read somewhere that there's less wars now and less war casualties now than there ever have been. That's what Pinker, Pinker says, right? Right. Yeah, but there's more wounded though that are returning home because of medical advances in the field and the ability to actually go in, fly into these actual, you know, kinetic battle areas and rescue them. So there's a ton of wounded that are returning, and of course the VA shuts all over them, but. Um, yes, it does. Yeah, there's there's less killed because of technological advances and advances in medical equipment and actual um, you know field operations. But to me, it's you know there's now more little wars that are undeclared all over the world than ever in American history. So yeah, I mean there's a there's a lot of negativity for me personally um, when I look at what's going on with the Islamic State, which is functioning as a legitimate state and. You know, there's a lot of pro-war, gung-ho conservatives that are like, yeah, stick a boot in the ass, it's the American way, you know? Bullshit yeah. Toby Keith lyrics. Um, 
people like that really frustrate me because they claim to be patriots and they claim to support the troops and you know they're they're all about you know honoring service members but yet they're advocating totally reckless totally ridiculous operational missions for them that mm -hmm. are completely you know have the the infinite potential to be this just perpetual quagmire and at, learning nothing from Afghanistan and learning nothing from Iraq you, we can't trust Washington no. to do anything coherent in these areas so why would you give them the license to do that again just because you think this enemy is a bigger boogeyman than the last one and it's, it's scary always, shit. but it's yeah. always a bigger boogeyman and like ISIS might indeed be worse than you know the other groups but it's always like this time we have to go in even yep. though you went in last time and you made this worse last time but this time you have to go in yeah there it's just the neocon globalist uh, nonsense that you know we're the only people that can go in and clean up the rest of the world without looking at the clusterfuck that we're making domestically through horrible awful policy decisions yeah I mean I'm I, I rebooted yeah it comes but, down to sometimes though, like is a little a million little wars worse than, I mean, you know, like World War II is a great example of there was an end and there was even you know a, a goal that was feasible, which was kill Hitler, which is a decent goal, um, <laughs> but you know it, it but during the course of that war you had just the peak of just the nastiest most brutal tactics that have ever been used in a war in that entire cities could be just raised. Um, and is the fact that we haven't done that in a while, like, any reason for optimism, or would we do that again if we needed to? You guys are really killing my optimism right now. I'm just saying. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. You know, I, have, I have this debate with um, soldiers often. I was a crisis counselor with uh, veterans for quite a few years, and um, I ran and operated a nonprofit for wounded Marines. So I feel very passionate about the rules of engagement and that the rules of engagement, it's, it's a double-edged edged sword. Yes, and this is what many soldiers who are advocates of the rules of engagement have told me, is that yes, it does hamper their combat effectiveness, which to me, I'm like, how can you say that's a good thing? Um, yes, it does roll back their ability to actually pull the trigger when they know that this is an engagement that is worthy of pulling the trigger, i.e. they're getting shot at or they're watching someone place a roadside bomb. I mean, in some places in Afghanistan, they had to go in, apprehend them, test their fingers for chemicals, detain them for 24, 48 hours, feed them, clothe them, give them water, and then release them back to pick up their operations the next day. I mean, it got down from that level of ludicrousness to okay, yeah, we need to not go in and just, you know, melee massacre a lot, you know, these villages, essentially. And their argument is that the rules of engagement, as confined and frustrating and awful as they are, have prohibited soldiers, even, from committing awful acts that would otherwise give them no moral, <laughs> no moral justification after the actual, after the actual situation went down, because they just went full tilt. Now they can't go full tilt. I mean, there's that side of the argument. Then the other side of the argument is, again, just war theory. Don't go to war half-ass. If you're going to go to war, that's why I hate just you go war to war. Theory. Yeah. I mean, there's, that's... I so think it's, it's bullshit. It's a, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated issue. And, you know, people who have actually served and who have been there kind of fall on both sides of it. Um, you know, my husband's and his friends and colleagues have said multiple times that they've literally been engagements and they're flying overhead and they see this kinetic activity but they're not being directly shot at and they have to let the guys get away even though they were combatants and that's that is going to only perpetuate the conflict endlessly because you're on one side because you're not actually taking the shot to kill your enemy which is supposed to be the whole purpose of war well, so what are you really doing? That's what why you, you shouldn't be there in the first place because I agree. Yeah, oh, I mean, I, there's totally, no way to 100% agree, yep. As bad as the U.S. is and has been in, when it goes to, you know, to war, in all, in every case, honestly, they could have been even worse. They could have bombed every single city indiscriminately during every conflict. They could have, you know, me lied every single village in Vietnam, and they didn't. So what they what they tend to do is is this horrible half-assed thing that does extend to war, 
long enough that it goes on for five or ten years, but you still have plenty of civilian casualties to be horrified about. I mean, that's why you just don't go there in the first place. I agree. I agree. And and I think I think a lot of soldiers and Marines and, and service members stand on both sides of that conflict, depending on their personal experience and what they feel about it. So mm -hmm. you don't even have a real a really coherent feeling amongst military members I've talked to about what the correct approach is. Very strict rules of engagement, which hamper the actual inevitable conflict. And the purpose is not to go and be an international policeman. You only send them over there to kill their enemy. Well, if you can't kill the enemy because you shouldn't be killing the enemy really to begin with because killing the enemy is creating blowback and perpetuating the war endlessly over and over and over again, who's benefiting from that? Obviously, it's, it's the military-industrial complex that pays for, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if you guys have seen the Vice documentary, the Afghanistan money pit, where we have literally spent, taxpayers have spent billions of dollars erecting these giant, you know, a, 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 anything that can basically produce electricity for a, almost half of these enclaves in these cities. But the Afghans can't maintain them. They don't know how to service them. They can't even operate them at all. They're literally a wasteful, a wasteful piece of giant uh, first world piece of equipment that could power cities that isn't operational at all. That goes back all the way to the actual military equipment that the contractors are benefiting greatly from because their revenue streams are just continuing to roll in, but they're taking this actual equipment and scrapping it down for metal and not even using it to allegedly fight the Taliban. Like It's such a racket and it's yeah. such a scheme and the longer that goes on, the worse it gets because we're literally creating an infinite amount of, of individuals who have either been wrongly shot by drones or their families have, have been lost or their entire you know, um, livelihood has been destroyed by this endless, pointless war. And so now you really are creating this sustainable conflict that is going to continue to blow back against us for 10, 15 years. Whew. Optimism! <laughs> I'm really not How super happy you? now. Oh, Meg, what have I done? I apologize for this. <laughs> I'm very, very purposeful. What's my cat doing? <laughs> Cat <laughs> Your cat's like, fuck this, you guys are expecting me, I'm yeah, out. My cat is making noises that I'm not familiar with, and that always makes me nervous. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I very purposefully like to stay away from war talk, because it depresses the hell out of me. All right, well, here's a visual aid that will represent optimism. Um, I would like to demonstrate. Here is a 3D printed octopus, and here okay. is a police car, and... See how he's winning over the state. This is <laughs> liber this is liber very happy about in its that. Essence. The new logo for us. It's beautiful. Someone draw this. It's the rock to post. He was 3D printed, and here is a police car. Right. Three. Um, we haven't even talked about 3D printers and how they could just. I know. 3D printing. Oh my god. Okay. So like right <laughs> now, there is. Um, and I just like found out about it today. So there's this Indiegogo campaign going on, and they've they've already like exceeded their um, goal, and they've got thirty some hours left, which I think is cool. But it's an Austin-based company called I forgot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me actually look this up really quick because this is important. Um, and my browser's going to try to crash. Um, but they actually are doing 3D like bio printing for um, breast reconstruction mm -hmm. uh, for women who have had mastectomies or lumpectomies. Um, and I 3D boobs! Yay! Yay! Yes. What a time to be alive. <laughs> um, I'm trying to. What is it called? I totally forgot, and I'm not on my laptop where I actually had this window open. This is bad. All right, you guys continue talking, and I'm going to interrupt you in a little bit and tell you what it's called. Okay. Three. Yeah, that's that's optimistic. Oh, that's good. great. Yes. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Like that, that's crazy, crazy cool. Um, and the stuff about it is like, um, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about breast reconstruction surgery, but from what I understand, like, you're not gonna have your boobs look like your boobs afterwards. Yeah. Um, but this is making your boobs look like your boobs. So yeah, that's really a ton cool. Of stuff I've heard about like. <laughs> I mean, I think I should learn more about 3D printing just so I stop thinking of it as magic because the way it's described, it's always like... That's cool. You can bring really your cool. hopes and dreams. Like, that's where we're at now. And also guns, which is awesome. Woo! Uh, it's another thing that 
the state can't control. If you can 3D print guns, then I mean, eventually the government's just going to run out of things it can control yeah. in any meaningful way as I technology grows. It's mostly true. I just worry about there's 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 a couple of walls. I mean, the war thing is a bitch, as we firmly concluded. Um, the drug war thing is improving both in a policy way and in a haha the Silk Road exists way. But I mean, there's still an element of like they can come shove you in jail if they want to type thing. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of technology that can just like, like the final steps, which we're obviously decades away from in the most optimistic reading, but like, I don't know, like how would we really just make the state into a tiny itty baby that we can drown in the bathtub with technology or with anything else? I don't know. A pleasant metaphor. Okay, so to interrupt you guys, so it's, uh, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of this, to, to veto bio devices, but if you Google reconstruct hope, um, you can find their Indiegogo campaign. And, like, they're already an established company, and this is just kind of taking them to the next level of what they can do with this. But I think that that is ridiculously cool. That's awesome. Yeah, to get to your question, Lucy, um, it's, it's actually, I think, decentralization is so key there. Um, the more, I mean, what do you really need the government for at this point? purpose and time. Like what? To issue your driver's license, to... To steal your monies. Yeah, I mean, about you, it. but you don't need them for that. They just do it. So what do you need <laughs> government? Like, when is the last time you went to a government facility to get something? And what what is it that you got? Uh, I, I think the last time I went to the DMV to get a driver's license. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. So... <laughs> Yeah, it was probably a DMV, but I don't know. It's been a long time since I went to a government building, which is nice. Yeah, my my marriage license. Like, yeah. I, I ordered that all online. The only thing I had to do was go and um, get that from the actual court. So, sorry, German Shepherd. It's you can order marriage licenses online now? That's really cool. You, yeah, but you have to actually physically go to the court location <laughs> to get it signed off by a judge and a magistrate. So... I actually had to go through that process, but that's the Can last time. We talk about and the block, but the blockchain, <laughs> the blockchain and its advance has the ability to replace a lot of these technologies over time. It's not something immediate, but if, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, and who knows? I have absolutely listened to Jeff Tucker like just po with poetic tears in his eyes talk about the blockchain. I've still have no I idea. I was there. No for the, idea. <laughs> I was there. I was present for the very first blockchain wedding. Right. And I, <laughs> it was amazing. I don't know. Jeffrey what that made means. me cry. <laughs> Jeffrey Tucker is able to make me cry a lot. Like I'm not a crier. I'm just not. Like you gotta do some serious shit for me to cry. Jeffrey Tucker makes me cry like every time I see him. <laughs> He's incredible. <laughs> He's pretty fantastic. <laughs> He's just so happy about everything. He is, and just, yeah, and so poetic and just so thrilled about the future of humanity. And it's just, oh. oh Julie Rovsky's parody of him with the cereal was so beautiful. I haven't seen I that. Oh, my God. <laughs> it sounds amazing. I'll have to find it. What show? Why isn't he on the show? He was uh, why well, isn't Jeffrey Tucker on this show? Because I thought of the theme five hours ago. <laughs> That's why. He said he was attending, so he was probably watching at some point, at least, and we had him on, and this is very disappointing. He's beaming in the <sighs> optimism from his blockchain palace. Yes. <laughs> Just say words, yeah. 3D printed house. Blockchain, 3D, palace. Uber it. Uber it. Let's Uber it. Disruption. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff, though. That's nice. Yeah, I mean, like, I think the, the Tucker-esque attitude is as is, is parody-able as it is sometimes with, like, fast food or cereal, as, as Julie once did in one of her videos. Like, I think there is something to emulate just in, like, being radical but optimistic, which is kind of a rare thing in the movement, again. Yeah. And I, I think uh, more of that would be good. Agreed, agreed, absolutely. I feel like there could be less McDonald's. But <laughs> but the fries sometimes dipped in sweet sometimes, sour sauce so, are really good. Yeah, uh, yeah fries. I'm okay with that. More a little more blockchain, definitely. Um, yeah. 
But in general, Jeffrey Tucker is a delight. <laughs> we need more of that in the movement. Yeah, just trying not to be... In, I mean, like, I think being a libertarian is compartmentalizing is just mandatory because you're like, oh, lovely friend who's liberal or lovely friend who, like, wants to bomb somewhere. Like, you believe in heinous things and I still like you. And that's the way it has to work unless you're going to lose your mind. Yeah, I mean, like, that's that's the whole thing. Like, we have, um, we have some people, <clears throat> Stefan Molyneux, <laughs> um, who think that like you that? should not have anyone in your life who isn't an anarchist? Granted, yeah, really, I think does he really think something like that? I don't. know. He wants you to like if your family like isn't isn't buying on to the whole and cat thing. He's like you should defu. I don't really understand what that means other than like right. you should leave your family, and never talk to them again. It's right. the dumbest term ever. But, I, I feel like we need less of that, <laughs> far, far less of that, and way more positive Jeffrey Tucker attitude that's very inclusive. Yeah. Because if you're, if you're just going to sit around there, like, if you're just going to be a dick to everyone that you know who doesn't believe exactly what you believe, like, good luck. Good luck <laughs> in life. <laughs> it's not, you're not going to have a good time. You'll probably who are you going to debate with? I mean, who are you going to debate with? Half the fun is arguing with people that I don't agree with. And like, yes, like that I would be so like, boring. I like disagreeing with people because you know what happens when you disagree with people? You each get to expand your mind. It's crazy. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I can't imagine just only having people in my life that agreed with me. Yeah, that would kind of suck, actually. That would be awful. <laughs> it would be. I, I mean, as much as, you know, in theory, if everyone agreed with us, like, the world would be sort of much better <laughs> in that people, true. Would, people wouldn't be coerced as much. But at the same time, I spent, like, so many years of my life being all like, haha, I was brainwashed to be a libertarian because I was homeschooled by libertarians. But, like, <laughs> the scores of Democrats, like, Democrats don't do that, you know? Like... I think that uh, like we we are more awesome because we by nature of existing in the statist world we have to talk to a bunch of people we disagree with, yeah. and that is good for you, and you just have to live with that, and it's okay. I kind of feel like any time your your attitude and approach to life could be confused with like a fundamentalist Christianity or like any type of extreme sort of religion. Scientology. It's Scientology. I mean, it, like, anything that goes to extremes, like, you probably should check yourself a little bit. Yeah. you might not be on a sane path. <laughs> so it's rather cultish. Yeah. Um, yes. And that's not a good thing. It's not. No, no. no. I don't think uh, collectivism amongst indiv individuals, <laughs> self-professed individuals, is ever a good idea. <laughs> no. I think it's okay to appreciate that there is, there can be a little sort of a little club sometimes like you know going to SFL or something and having this cathartic weekend of like we all basically agree the state needs to be a lot smaller and like we're starting there like that's how minute we can be but we it would be very bad for us to have a students for liberty weekend for our whole lives that would be That'd totally be pointless <laughs> there was actually it was a post on Reddit. This was a month or so ago, maybe. I, I don't remember exactly. I'm, my memory is terrible, especially with time. I don't understand time at all. <laughs> um, but it was a post on the small-ish subreddit R anarcho-capitalism, and someone posted. And I, I don't know if this was a joke. I fucking hope it was a joke. But someone posted, "Ancap has made me lose all my friends." <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> and, wow! But no, but, like it was seriously this person. Was it Christopher that was, Cantwell? Was he? Posted? I it, probably. Um, but it was You're seriously something. this person telling the story about like going to it was the grocery store or something like that and seeing one of his friends he hasn't talked to in a while and like his friend saw him and like asked like hey how's it going how are you doing and mm -hmm. the dude just like said he looked at him and was like and I knew he was still a status and I didn't say anything. <laughs> 
it wasn't like quite that dramatic, but it was almost that dramatic. And like I really, really, really thought it was a joke post, but I just don't know because I have come across these people in real life. So I don't know. So yeah. if, if ANCAP has made you lose all your friends, it's not ANCAP's fault. You're doing something <laughs> wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's just like, I don't know, there's just like a really, for me it's always like a really delicate balancing act, which I fucked up last night with Matt Welsh as the internet will now see forever. <laughs> Which I'm gonna nice. say I'm gonna have to go and like read your entire comment. Yeah, it's it's not I'm gonna, I'm gonna storify. I, it. <laughs> I will kill you, by the way. Um, but the point is like, my entire like fourth grade ask like I'm gonna sort of rivet you until we have a like a jolly sparring match thing, which works a lot of the time, and it's unfortunately just how I function. You have to do that and not be, you know, Christopher Cantwell or just like a truly insufferable person who just <laughs> I don't know. It's like it, it all comes down to like the you know the obscenity. I know it when, or pornography. I know it when I see it type thing. There's just like you just have to be a, like a human, you know, like a, <laughs> a, like more than anything else. Whatever you do, like and remember remember that the people disagreeing, even if they believe something really shitty, which they might, you know, nuking. Most people I know believe that melting a cities full of Japanese children was okay. So that's kind of a downer to me. But if I go around calling them all serial killers, like it's just, there's no help, you know, that doesn't do anything good in the world. Yeah, you're jumping, you're jumping from like A to X. <laughs> there's there's a, a bit of space in between there. Right. Where you have to kind of bridge the gap and yeah, treat them like a fellow human being who may just not have the information that you have and may be thinking a totally different paradigm than you are. Mm -hmm. Don't, just be, don't be a dick. Don't be a Mark Ames. Right. That's something you would do. Yeah. You have to be an actual human to other people, even if they had bad ideas in the past. Yeah. You know. yeah. I mean, just, they... because of, just because you weren't aren't old enough to have blog posts that you know, were from a different time in your life doesn't mean you can just go back willy nilly and. <laughs> I deleted out. my live journal. Thank you very much. <laughs> So you have the benefit of off record. not having anything like that. Where you can <laughs> scandalous things. I think my Zanga is still out there, though. I'm, I'm going to be looking for that. Uh, <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, Ryan Nielsen asks, how do I join this discussion? I also want to know that. How do we even see who's viewing and what are – is there's a chat or anything? Or? Yeah, hang, Hangouts on Air is very new to Tiffany and me. I have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> it, it didn't appear to me that there was a chat uh, capacity in the on-air thing, which is a bummer. But actual questions can be asked. Um, actually, we can we can put someone on air. Is the thing. Yeah, I think he but wants to come do that. that. And yeah. in the future, we should use Slack because it does actually integrate with Google Hangouts. Ah, oh, dude. The only the only problem here is like I have to get people's email addresses beforehand and add them to Slack. Well, that should, sucks, but it's yeah. like a permanent chat thing. So if people want to hang out and like talk throughout the week, we yeah. can do that. So that'd be cool. Well, yeah. if we have any questions, I'm definitely up for question time. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I can't see what or how to do it, but yeah, I think he wants to. Do we just add people in the discussion? Um, I think what you have to do here is you need an email address or a Google Plus. Like, so you need a name. Can I, can I invite Jeffrey Tucker? Yes, absolutely. You can. <laughs> you you actually, actually, I think it won't let me. It won't let me. Ask. Oh, damn it! I'm right, well, clicking the button. Okay. Like, yeah, Lucy, I think you have to do it. I think you're an admin. This is another problem with this. Is you're the Hangouts on Air queen, so right, you're well, allowed to invite. I, I invited Jeff. I invited Jeff, but like our on-air dude, we need um, an email or a Google Plus name. Yeah, so if you could just submit another question with like your. Well, here I'll send you. We have a we have an internal chat here, so let me send you because um, Ryan is in my circle. So okay. let me let me send you in the chat um, what his Google Plus is right there. I think this is the biggest downside to Hangouts on Air, not having a live chat. Yeah, I think we should go back to Spreecast. <laughs> <laughs> it is tricky. It is Spreecast. Tricky. <laughs> Good. All right. Is that Jeffrey Tucker? Um, uh, I am I am he. What what Hi. what's going on? We are I'm having optimistic. 
<laughs> we are one at a time, ladies. Ladies, one at a time. I know we all want to talk about it. <laughs> Jeffrey! We are on Hangouts on Air. We're doing uh, Bourbon for Bitches Who Hate Politics. Across it's our crossover episode. spectacular. Right. Yeah, and we were talking about, like, optimistic liberty and technology, and, like, you're the king of that. Right. Well, uh, so I just uh, showed up on a live show. <laughs> yes, you just <did. laughs> We have eight, count them, eight people watching, so be on your best behavior. Eight people. <laughs> so many. <laughs> so, Jeffrey, the center question is, how can technology roll back the state, in Lucy's quotes, until it is small enough like a baby that you can drown in a bathtub. <laughs> but don't drown a real baby. <laughs> I, I think you know, the state, it's not that the, sh the state is going to shrink. What's going to happen is that liberty is going to grow. And that our proportion of the world that we, that the good guys control is going to become so disproportionately large that the state <laughs> will find that the, 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 the things that it's trying to enforce are essentially unenforceable. And there's a very good example of this that just, just happened a couple of days ago in South Carolina. Did you follow this case? Um, no. Well, so, so here's, a good, here's a good example. So, so Uber um, was banned in South Carolina. The entire and, state? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh my god. So, so a woman, <laughs> so a drunk woman was getting out of a bar. <laughs> And she click, clicked her Uber app and said, um, come here right away. And so the Uber car showed up. And she was about to get into it. And a, uh, a, a, a policeman showed up and said, sorry, you can't get into that car. What? She said, she Why? Said, this is absurd. Why? She said, and he said, because, because these ride-sharing services like this have been banned. Yeah, and she said, "Who made that stupid rule? <laughs> the state legislature, or you know, the regulators, or something?" And she goes, "You know what? Fuck you, asshole!" <laughs> and started to get in the car, and he arrested her. Wow. Oh. Okay, so there's a couple of things about this. I mean, one is, how can you possibly expect to enforce a rule throughout an entire state against a ride-sharing service? Um, that operates peer to peer. Here, I yeah. mean, there aren't enough police in the world to do that. Right. Uh, the second thing is that, from a point of view of public relations, it is a very, very bad thing for the regulators and bureaucrats in South Carolina to be arresting uh, drunks who are trying to stay off the road. Seriously. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's not a living soul on this planet. Who would enforce? Who would uh, favor such a rule as that? So it becomes essentially uh, both unenforceable and politically unsustainable. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, under these under these kinds of conditions. I mean, th this this whole sort of crackdown we're seeing on the P2P economy strikes me as a um, a temporary situation. You know, essentially unenforceable. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and and the more the P2P revolution continues, uh, the, the more this will be true. And this is true in, in every area, from from uh, apartment rentals to dinner parties uh, to, to sales and services. Um, I'm very intrigued, for, for example, to see how the um, all the local laws you see against against um, things like. Uh, you know, for for occupational licensure and so on, can can sustain uh, services like uh, uh, TaskRabbit, for example. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if the bureaucrats don't know about it, how can they possibly prevent it? Mm -hmm. And even if they do uh, do know about it, they're the one percent. We're the ninety nine percent. So the more the more of us are involved in these kinds of services. Uh, <coughs> the less the stuff is going to be enforceable over time. Anyway, that's that's my perspective. Okay. I like that. So, Jeffrey, your story... Uh, on, on a broader scale, you know, there's something weird. Yeah, go, go ahead, Meg. I'm sorry. I've talked long enough. <laughs> I was just going to say that your story about South Carolina actually reminded me of um, something I heard this week. So I've been listening to this fantastic podcast, which I highly recommend. It's called Startup Podcast. Um, it's one of the top ones on iTunes right now. And um, he's actually documenting, he's starting up 
a startup <laughs> for podcasting and he's been recording the whole thing and it, it's it's from one of the like former producers or something of this american life so like it's it's really high quality stuff very very interesting and just well done um but so they they first started going after you know vcs um and they started getting some funding and then all the people listening to startup started like flooding their inbox being like well hey i i have some money like can i can I invest in you guys? Like, I, I love this. I, I want to be a part of this. And so all of these people actually can't invest at all, even though the Jobs Act has been passed, like this one little part of the Jobs Act about, like, allowing, you know, everyday people that have some money <laughs> to invest in a company. Yeah. Um, you have to, like, there's some holdup. So you still have to be... Um, you have to have made it, it's you have to be making like two hundred thousand dollars a year or have um, at least a million like stocked away uh, for you to be able to invest in a company. Um, so he was actually he had one of the the women who had contacted him about investing who like does not meet the requirements of being an investor. <laughs> um, she was being interviewed on the show and he was going through, okay, well, here's why you can't invest in Gimlet Media. Um, it's because, like, you don't meet all these requirements and, like, there's a holdup with the government. And um, so she started talking about how, like, ridiculous that was and how it just felt like it felt kind of like a nanny state. And all of the language she was using was language that I was very familiar with. And so the host, Alex Bloomberg, goes, so how long have you been a libertarian? And she's like, well, I, I, I think I just became one. <laughs> and so I thought that was just absolutely hilarious and kind of inspiring because as soon as the state interferes with your life in a way that you think is just completely ridiculous, you start questioning things. Yeah. That's good. I like that. I mean, I was going to ask, though, maybe if you went back before, you know, the war on drugs, you might optimistically say well the state can't you know stop you from doing drugs and obviously we've learned it can't stop you it can just make life very miserable for <laughs> as many people as possible and to increase the prison population and lots of horrible things like that is it i mean what's you know going to stop the state from deciding it's going to seriously crack down on you know the war on uber or the war on airbnb and all these other things is it because sort of acceptable people need to get from point A to point B or sleep somewhere and it's not, you know, sort of the stigma that drugs and other sort of I, more I edgy it, things have? I mean, what, or is it hopefully more that, you know, they, they've lost their taste for that kind of jackbooted thuggery? <laughs> I think it's a mix of things, really. So you have, okay, respectable people, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. um, respectable people. Uh, who, who defines what that is. Mm. Um, but also, I mean, all these things are ultimately, like, super P2P and facilitated by technology. And, I mean, like Jeffrey said, what what, what are the police going to do? Are they really going to stop every Uber driver and every Uber uh, rider? That's not feasible. Like, they don't have the manpower to do that. Um, so I think decentralization is really changing things and shaking things up in that way. Yeah. I mean, one of the great ironies, even on a, on a I like what you said about drugs being stigmatized. Um, one of the great ironies of the Ross Ulbricht trial that's going on right now is here they are trying this guy for being an innovator. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the service that he innovated is now, you know, 10, 20 times as big as when they arrested him. <laughs> You know, there's, there's 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 six or so large-scale Amazon uh, narcotics marketplaces online right now. You know, so, uh, there's there's nobody that's going to be able to stop this stuff. So it, it all becomes a little bit uh, futile after a while. It's it's kind of like striking down Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> like most it becomes more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Yeah, I know, exactly. I know. <laughs> And what happens? What happens when juries are unwilling to convict? You know, that's that's one of the ways that the war on drugs began to break down. You know, um, when prosecutors simply could not find jurors who were willing to 
put people behind bars for medical marijuana. You know, when I just, yep. and then they just, they stop bringing the cases. I mean, that's the one thing about, about prosecutors in the, the state. They hate to lose. And if they know they're going to lose, they're going to try to strike up some deal. And, and, and the more that um, defendants know that the state does not want to go to trial, the better bargaining position they're in. And I think there's a point, like, point, a pessimistic point of contention, though, is that with a lot of drug stuff, the problem actually has been that they haven't gotten to trial, but they get browbeaten into a plea bargain without having to go before a jury who, you know, we, we all hope would actually nullify. But a plea bargain relies on a, a kind of cat and mouse game uh, of, of, boy, mixing metaphors, I was going to say, of chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Right. That's good. I like that. <laughs> I gotta figure out some other way to put that, but you know what I mean. So, so uh, if 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 the defense of of the of for the uh, for the defendant is certain that uh, the prosecution cannot get their case um, tried in against against um, you know in a way that results in in a favorable judgment for the state. Um, these plea bargains actually become less advantageous to the state. So, and that begins to happen. This is the way the systems break down, essentially. I and mean, they result from a loss of, of public confidence in the, in the law. And it takes time, you know, but I think the drug war has shown us one way in which this begins to happen. I mean, don't forget, 40 years ago, Richard Nixon swore he's going to drive pot from our shores. <laughs> I think that one of the beautiful things about... The internet, though, I mean, there's so many beautiful things about the internet, um, but you get into contact and you see, like, how many people are using marijuana, because, I mean, that's, that's the easy one to deregulate right now, right? You see how many different people are using marijuana for various reasons, medicinally or recreationally, from your grandma to your idiot teenage cousin. And it's actually not ruining their lives. <laughs> right. It's making their lives better. And, like, it's actually being treated by so many people as medicine. And, I mean, even watching TV, like, on pretty much, I think, every episode of SNL for the past, I don't know how long, like, someone mentions weed in a positive way. is like, well, obviously I smoke marijuana. It's, like, not even a thing. So I, I really appreciate that. Like, there's a cultural shift at least with marijuana, well, that I mean, it's just something that people do. Part of that has got to be the simple fact that something like a hundred million Americans have tried marijuana. Like it's, whereas like with heroin, um, it's well, I think with regular users, you know, addicts or function, hopefully more functioning addicts, um, over the decades, it's usually about half a million people. Just it it, it it's gone up a little bit lately, I think, but it's been really flat. Mm -hmm. And marijuana. I mean, the stigma against it rather proves not just obviously the moral horror of banning it, but the fact that they picked such a popular, relatively safe thing to ban, almost <laughs> as if they don't know what the hell they're doing, even if they should be doing it. Yeah, uh, it's kind of dumb. It's very dumb. <laughs> Super dumb. <laughs> so, this is good. We're um, fix fixing the state here. Um, so I'm going I'm going to head up, but you know what? I'm going to get back on a little bit and watch. Have you already talked about um, this this movie that's made everybody crazy that I haven't seen because I'm afraid to watch it? You mean American, American Sniper? Sniper? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. I was, I I'm was afraid gonna say afraid that. to watch it, Jeffrey. <laughs> I was going to, but the snow might prevent me this weekend. Um, Tiffany's seen it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm <laughs> I mostly like Disney movies and, and things like that. I mean, <clears throat> for me, it's already a, a step. If a movie contains real people as opposed to animation, it's already it's already got a mark against it. <laughs> um, but um, I dread about Killians more. I'm just not so sure. But um, um, I'd love to uh, have to hear any comments you have about it. So, so anyway... I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you for inviting me in. Thanks for the spontaneous presence. Yes, yes we're, we were happy really to have you. Bye, Jeffrey. Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, well, Lucy, do you feel better now? Do you feel a little bit more optimistic? 
it's the magic of Jeff Tucker. His, his light <laughs> just shines in, and now, and now half of the social problems and political issues that we were dealing with are pretty much solved. So yep. no worries. We it's, you're good now. Liberty cartoons up. forever. <laughs> yeah, you're you're good now. Mm. Hey Ryan. Hi Ryan. We're all smiling. So that's the right Ryan, right? Because there are like a thousand of them on Google Plus, and I think. Damn it, Ryan's and your damn popular names. By the way, hi Ryan. We've been communicating on Facebook for years. It's nice to see you through the interwebs. Oh, so like he's a real person to you now. It yes. turns out that Ryan was the most popular name in 1985, which is when I was born. So. Well, there you wait. Uh, it's your yeah. Well, there you go. I don't know. I got a I got a Matt over here. I think uh, I think Matt and Ryan are right on point. His yeah, brother, those, his brother's uh, name is Ryan. Like, yeah, his, his brother's name is Ryan. For fuck's <laughs> sake, I mean, right. seriously. Let's let's. It's Ryan, Andrew, and Matt. So pretty much nailing down the '80s there. We're good. <laughs> and we have a Matt too, who was born in '88. And Tiffany and I are constantly like confusing people when we're talking my about Matt. That. My Matt, no, your Matt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just, you're both married oh. to the same man. It's cool. Polygamy is good, or not polygamy, the other one, <laughs> with the two ladies, I don't remember what it's called. Um, <laughs> no, this is polygamy, with the two, yeah, if we're married to the same man, then it's polygamy. <laughs> you're, right, you're right, you're so right. It, it would be I'm polygyny, right, it yeah. would be polygyny otherwise. Yes, this is why I we think. keep you around, I think. Maybe. <laughs> Anthropology degree being useful. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what, what's, so what's up, Brian? Uh, what? So what's up, Ryan? You had a question? What's up? How's it going? Well, I was trying to figure out what this hangout was about. Like, you guys usually have a theme for this thing. I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> we, yeah, we don't have a theme this time, so it's a yes, cross episode. It's optimism. Oh, yeah, optimism. I forgot. It's, the, it's yeah. a very, very broader than usual theme, but it's the one that yeah. I thought. So of. We're, we're doing crossover episode, though, so, like, we... Tiffany, Lucy, and I usually do Bourbon and Bitches, but Lucy also does politics for people who hate politics. So we decided we should do bur bourbon for bitches who hate politics. Yes, bourbon for bitches who hate politics. <laughs> or that's, my, that preferred, is good. Yeah, that's, that's it. my preferred version, bitches for politicos who love bourbon. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> I like the first one. <laughs> like the is your question, one. what's the theme? Because that's a bad <laughs> well, question. Well, I, whenever, whenever I talk to somebody, I usually try to stay on track as to what the theme is, so I'm not like trailing off and getting on wild tangents. <laughs> oh, we like those. I mean, any like question related to anything vaguely libertarian is welcome. This is I mean, I'm, I'm on here. Come on. I'm going to go like 16 different directions with anything <laughs> I say. Come on. <laughs> High speed, man. High speed. It's okay. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah. How many uh, you guys are going to uh, ISFLC? Wait, how how many you say? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going. going. <laughs> Sad face. Are you going? <laughs> I'm going. Yeah, I actually um I actually plan to attend, but uh, some really unique opportunities have come up that same week. So I'll be yeah. helping. I'll help the Liberty Me crew get off the ground and do all their awesome things there, and uh, kind of plan the conference for them. But I won't be attending this year. I will be looking along from a distance sad <laughs> because Ron Paul and Judge Andrew Napolitano are all going to be there. And also Vicente and Fox. And I'm going to be there. Me. Hey, yeah. Look yeah. forward to Lucy. Lucy is going to be there. Yeah. I, I'd also hear that Vicente Fox is going to be there. And I would love to punch him in the face. So <laughs> this is Fair probably enough. a good thing. It's probably a good thing. Yeah. So, but no, I'm, it's going to be awesome. The student groups are fantastic. I have literally, that is the most fun I have ever had with libertarians ever. Yeah, yeah. It is a total shit show, a opportunity for networking, so many amazing personalities. It's going to be bigger than ever this year. Um, Liberty Me is hosting an art gala uh, that Jeffrey is participating in as well. So they're actually going to be featuring student filmmakers and artists and graphic designers and poets and people who are actually libertarian and creating true art from what they're doing. Sorry, my German Yay. shepherd is grabbing a sausage thing from the trash. She wants to... <laughs> yeah, I'm like, really? Why are you taking advantage of me being busy right now that you want to <laughs> dig in the trash, asshole? Conniving. Um, Conniving. Yeah, she's, she's devious, man. She's devious. Too smart for her own good. Germans, that's how they roll. <laughs> but, uh, are, are you going to be there, Ryan? Are you attending? Yeah, I'm going to be there. 
definitely. Awesome! It'll be fun. It'll be a really, say, really good time. I was going to say, regards to your German Shepherd, uh, I'd rather watch the Puppy Bowl than the Super Bowl. Just saying. Oh, really the Puppy Bowl! Is everybody in the Puppy Bowl? Bowl. It's not puppies, so it can't be all bad. Is everyone watching the Puppy Bowl? You have to. I've never watched it. I don't okay, know. I, oh, I watched it in the past, but I don't do cable, so I'll probably not be watching the Puppy Bowl. Damn you. I don't even have a TV. I plan to watch it online if I can. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, what's funny is I give no shits. I mean, like, the Super Bowl is like, you know, a holiday. And I'm like, really? I don't give a shit about either one of these teams, and I don't know any fans that I I don't control. even know what teams are playing. Absolutely. Like, I could not get out of here, Lucy. Get out of here. <laughs> well, bye. No, no. You're a terrible no. Steigerwald. I am the uh, worst Steigerwald there is. There's absolutely no question about that. Uh, yeah. Um, so, all, you need, all you need to know is that how the Super Bowl could be improved this year is if both teams could lose. So okay. that's what really that. who who is playing though. So am I right about the Cowboys being one of the teams? Okay, I, as a bitter Cowboys fan, <laughs> as a bitter Cowboys fan, <laughs> as a I am not even going to talk about this because <laughs> fuck you and your bullshit NFL rules that prohibited an amazing catch that should have been totally valid. And you fuck this out of it. So Wait, the, so Patriots the Cowboys aren't one of the ones? No, I, the Cowboys I, are screwed. Okay, so who's actually playing? Like, I, I legitimately do not know. I don't I mean, know either. Tiffany, I tried to schedule I, a meeting for Sunday. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes Meg, Meg, and I, Meg and I are working on a consulting firm that we're uh, building up, and we've already got clients kind of interested in rolling in, and she's like, yeah, let's have a cool meeting and a great brainstorming discussion on Sunday at 2 o'clock. I'm like, seriously, like, wow. everyone, So everyone, that's, the Super Bowl's on Sunday, because I do yeah. that. Yes, oh, it's it's always always on Sunday. Like I know it's on a Sunday. I just didn't know it was that Sunday. No, you know how, like, Christmas is on the 25th of every year? Yes. <laughs> Super Bowl is on a Sunday every year. First Sunday of February. No, like, seriously, we that's have, have six people. people. <laughs> 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 And yeah. Tiffany is the only one who's like, I mean, well, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and like, <laughs> Tiffany and I are the only girls. And none of the guys knew either. <laughs> oh, fair enough, then. Fair none enough. of the guys knew either. I'm like, you guys are ridiculous. They don't do sports ball. Actually, no, one did. One did know, but he thought it like business and friendship was more important than sports ball. It's true. Yes. Uh, yeah. it's not wrong there. <laughs> do we have any... <laughs> Do we have any libertarian-related questions besides <laughs> will you be somewhere? And the answer is just me. Even or, though besides, should totally go to. or besides F the Patriots I do, and F the Seahawks? Which one? I do have to say that like at ISFLZ, I was most excited about hanging out with Lucy Stag. Like, I've, I've met Raw Paw. He was pretty cool. I don't really have anything to talk to him about. I've hung out with the judge. He's pretty cool. I'm... That's done. <laughs> but Lucy, okay. I've never met I'm you. Now I'm even more envious. Libertarian <laughs> mountain of awesomeness, and you plateaued <laughs> at the judge and Ron Paul, and I'm next, but we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> Not yet. I'm actually so kind I'm, of disappointed uh, in the guests beside Ron Paul. What well, was that? Snowden, by the way. Ooh, that's uh, exciting, actually, though. Even though he's not, I mean, a big picture of him talking, but not really him. <laughs> so that's fine. Ryan, do you have real questions? Uh, I was going to ask you guys what you thought about this uh, libertarian girl thing. It seems, it seems to me it's very, I don't want to say it's like fake, but it seems like she's just a face to put on the movement to try to uh, well, attract I, mean, I, think, oh, I, no. I feel like this is kind of weird for Tiffany because we're friends with her. Um, <laughs> wait, 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 what was it? Hold on, hold on. What was like what was the question? Because I you broke up a little bit, and it's probably my shitty. Oh, I was trying to figure out what you guys thought of, about her. Like she came to prominence through some Republican person attacked her for saying something, and she said something about how John McCain was bloodthirsty. And I mean, she you said know, I'm not all sorts that. of things that are true. And then the Washington well, Post well, was a miserable neocon rag. Trash her for it because they're trying yeah. to trash Rand Paul. That is the entire thing. That's yeah, all. pretty much. I, okay, I, I hold understand. On, hold on, hey, are, are we talking about Marianne Copenhaver? We are. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, no, 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 no. Um, I know Marianne. I've known her for years. We've worked together very closely. She's a very 
hardcore, extremely passionate person that dedicates, fuck man, 80 to 100 hours of her life every week to liberty causes. It's like, literally, she's a talented graphic designer, she got hopefully brought on to this campaign long term, it's going to bust her ass to try to get Rand Paul elected because she thinks that the alternative is awful. The alternative is awful. Uh, Jeb Bush is awful. Uh, Mark Rubio well, or yeah. whatever. Anybody else is probably a poor choice for president, yeah, yeah, yeah. save for yeah, so, Andrew so, Napolitano. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but we're, oh, my God. His speeches, his State of the Union addresses would be so just like, we're in the Constitution. You know, yeah. Like, my friend recently had his wedding officiated by Andrew Napolitano. I wasn't there, but I'm really excited that it happened <laughs> because that's so beautiful that I just can't even think about it. So, so Ryan, what is your um, what was your specific question about that? I don't think well, a lot of people realize what she does behind the scenes, which is a lot. Well, I'm not, I'm not denying that she works hard or anything like that. I'm, I'm just saying that. Uh, I, I try to like when I go to libertarian events. I try to dress as nice as possible and, and try to try to present the the most professional image as possible. And I see all these like uh, like ragtag elements kind of falling behind it, and those aren't bad necessarily. But we have to understand that our perception by other groups is extremely important because if we're always perceived as these, as these weird people who play, you know, Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons, we're never going to be taken seriously. So I, I want to. You know, for ex for example, uh, her her comments are John McCain is a bloodthirsty psychopath or whatever he, he is. said. He oh, is. I, I, I'm not, I am not refuting that point in any way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here's the problem, though, Ryan. Okay. Let Let's take that first point on. Right. So I am very blunt and I'm very direct. I believe in speaking my mind. It's very difficult for me to censor myself. That's why we get right. along. She and I get along because, right. it's, and and she has a public platform that's very visible where she's engaging on topics that just like people on this panel get literally physically angry about the bullshit that takes place. So pop it off at the mouth, which may look like that's what that is from the outside or or not professional or not like a clean response. It's not calculated. Like that's her and actual raw Fuck you, thought it, it I is, and I'm that. pretty sure too that like I I don't know when she actually made this comment, but like clearly the Daily Beast people like they dredged up some stuff <laughs> basically. So I don't really think that she thought when she was making those comments that she would be working on the Rand Paul campaign. Yeah, the, the, the yeah. Daily the Daily Beast one was. I mean, making this real news sort of bums me out, but it, there, she, you know, th <laughs> that woman reporter at least talked to people and clarified that, like, this wasn't as bad as the Jack Hunter shenanigans, and even Jack Hunter got kind of screwed, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, Definitely. there was more nuance in it. The Beacon was just this embarrassing, like, libertarian <laughs> expresses libertarian thoughts. <laughs> That's a big deal thing. And I was yeah. like, no, you, uh, I mean, this is about Rand Paul. It's not about her. And... And it's particularly infuriating, and we've discussed this before in this panel, that, like, the her thing about the Pledge of Allegiance is going to be is going to be mocked or, like, disputed at all when she's completely, completely correct about the historical origin of the Pledge of Allegiance. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, main thing, the, main thing about, the main thing about saying that John McCain is bloodthirsty, John McCain, I voted for John McCain. I lived in Arizona for eight years. I'm, I, I was a former <laughs> conservative. Like, I voted for him. I met him on a plane and quizzed him about his politics one time, flying standby, and my mom has flight benefits, okay? I got first class, all right? I was there, right? And, and what, I, what I don't like is that John McCain is a total whore for the military-industrial complex. He knows it. Washington political insiders know it. And we have to say it. So that other people know it. When you sing bomb, 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 Iran, I mean, Tehran is a fucking beautiful city full of people that are oppressed by an awful government that we take some responsibility for its rise to power no doubt. because yeah. we manipulated their government situation. We, you know, stage a fucking coup that then, you know, kind of became this this oppressive 
awful mass murdering regime that oppressed freedom. And then we whine yeah. about them storming our embassy after we literally were just like, oh, your government's going It's right so now. awful. And so Washington has made awful calls, horrible policy decisions when it comes to Iran. And because of the close relationship between America and Israel, and because Israel is scared of what the hell these crazy people that are now in power could do, there's a lot of back channel communication that takes place to protect them as an ally and also the volatility in the Middle East. And so this constant call, I mean, look, Iran is, what, three, four times the size of Iraq? And we could not, after having a total disaster of that war, which cost my countrymen their lives, many of them have returned who are not are shells of themselves, that is not even something we should ever even fucking joke about. Like, let's go in and bomb Iran and then take them over. I mean, what are you going to do? Nation build? This is ludicrous. So, and the, on the only reason torture. he objects to torture is that he was tortured. Like, I truly yeah. believe that if he had not been tortured, he would not care about it. And I, I think he's just, he's been in Washington for too long. He's fucking old. He needs to retire. He's out of date. He's irrelevant. He's just a very connected crony that has gone way too long inside of the beltway. And so, of course, yeah, I think so. he's, he is bloodthirsty. Like, Lindsey Graham's going to take place as soon as he retires. Lindsey Graham's going to take his place. As him. Does that make sense? When is Lindsey so Graham going to come out of the closet? That's what I really want to know. <laughs> I want him to stay in a closet and stop legislating things. And we're well, that too. Yeah. Oh, Lindsey Graham. By the way, I admin the Facebook page Graham Cracker. If anybody wants to take a shot of him. <laughs> Well, I'm welcoming admins. Right an awful, now. awful human being. <laughs> He's very bad. Awful. He's I think he what bad. spent like six weeks, you know, inside the wire in Iraq, and he's like, I'm a veteran. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was actually the Air Force Colonel, which which was surprising to me. Dude, you're, 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 wait, hold on. You're uh, you're I can't hear. You're uh, you you're moving. Little... You're moving your laptop, I think, and the mic is. Like yeah, what, yeah. What did, what were you saying? What were you saying, Ryan? Sorry. So Grant, Grant was a colonel in the Air Force. So if he showed up to my base, I'm stationed here at Charleston. He showed up to my base, and they made us move this aircraft for him. And move it into place, and have this huge prop, and they called everyone from the base there. We're going to have a senator. Okay, it's a, it's a big dog and pony show. <laughs> and he shows up, and like, like all these people are like, you know, groveling at his feet. And then the whole entire thing was this pitch for votes and to talk about sequestration and how it's going to make your lives suck and I'm going to, I'm going to stop it from happening. Yep. I'm just mm -hmm. like, what in the crap? This is He's awful. <laughs> He's an awful human being. But again, Wait, so like, Lindsey Graham is an awful person. Like, can we just call him an awful person? He is I would love to be able to do that. Like, I... I know, like, I don't want to be LouRockwell.com and just, like, alienate everybody. <laughs> but by the same token, the, the, the other thing to be is to sort of tolerate everybody and to, you know, to treat politics like this, either a fun game where it doesn't matter what happens or, like, a really, um, it, it's a fun game or it's, like, a noble pursuit. You know, you're a public servant. And, and, and both of those are complete bullshit because it is bullshit but it's also very serious because cumulatively, you know, politics kills people when you get a bunch of people together. So, like, I just refuse, like, I, Marianne did nothing even remotely wrong. I mean, nothing she said. She was right about the pledge. She, you know, said mean but not that mean things about politicians. I mean, it was nothing. It was such bullshit. It drove me crazy. Like, if you can't say that about politicians because it's, like, not proper or something, whatever. Like, give me Justin Amash, who when he, you know, when he um won, you know, the, the nomination for the Republican seat again was like, thanks, by the way, for implying I was a terrorist all the time because of my Pakistani descent. Fuck you. Like, and he was really ungracious in the most delicious sort of way because, you know, those people, they were, they were basically implying he must like terrorism because he doesn't like war and he's from Pakistan. Or Well, you know what? I, I agree with that. And you know what's great? I used to get off on freaking watching C-SPAN and British Commons 
to politics. Like they would just <laughs> go to war with each other. Like dude, we need oh, the British. Ooh, yeah, we need the yelling. It's so much more. It's awesome. great, man. Bring back like the Roman sen Roman Senate style, minus the stabbing, maybe. But still, like you, <laughs> you really, you had vigorous debate and aggression and bullshit and passion. In instead of just this, I'm gonna stand up here and say <laughs> stupid things and no one's gonna watch because we're all fucking lawyers and everyone wants to fall asleep, so right, no exactly. one pays attention to politics. You need passion. You need shots fired. I mean, if you don't have that, Jesus, that was the fucking <sighs> inception of this country was shots. Fired, man. <laughs> you need the House of Parliament where they just stand there and like yell at each other yeah. and talk shit for the whole. That is beautiful to me. Like, give me that. Give me that in American <laughs> politics. The Daniel Hannon rant. Did you ever see? He was he was in in Parliament. I think he still is. Um, he's like the most libertarian British man alive. It, like it went viral because it was just like three minutes of him destroying, I believe, Gordon Brown and his economic policies. It's just like three minutes of him. You know, you're the devalued prime minister of a devalued nation, like you're the worst guy ever. It's so classy and British and just like destroys him. Beautiful. And meanwhile, in America, we're like this embarrassing teenage nation where we're like, we're dressing up in like black <laughs> that doesn't fit us and we're pretending to be really pomp and circumstance filled. And we're like, we don't have the. Like, we're not comfortable enough to actually do that kind of thing. We have all this pomp and circumstance bullshit, which was the opposite of what we were supposed to have. Read Gene Healy's The Clone of the President. It's awesome. Like, we weren't supposed to be this way. We were supposed to be, like, walking into the White House and booing everybody. And I mean, agree. Like, you look, you look at campaigns now, and you're like, oh, man, these guys are total dicks to each other. And then you look at campaigns... Uh like the 1800s and or 1700s even and you're like wow these guys are really total dicks to each other totally I mean, if, if we're gonna have a state if we're gonna have politics like at least make it entertaining like and Jesus be honest Christ. <laughs> be honest like the god the freaking dana milbank column from a couple months ago where he's whining about the salty language politicians use and he like jokes about torture salty language yeah, like in the first, yeah, because Dick Cheney <laughs> said the torture report was crap. I can't believe politicians use such salty words. Oh, that's words. so salty! Oh my goodness, <laughs> sailor. <laughs> um, wow. Joe, yeah, Joe. Well, maybe, to anything maybe I would wrong. like to see uh, in American <laughs> politics. Who can, get a, who can get a word in edgewise at this point? Bitches be talking, Joe. Bitches be talking. Oh, man, I know, I know how these things work. <laughs> you got it. I'm going to stand back here. You're, you're just you're just an honorary bitch. It's pretty, okay? You just sit so there and look pretty. Good. The only concern is if we don't wrap this up, no one will ever watch this when it comes on YouTube. This is true. Ever. It's going on for a while. It's about an hour and a half now. An hour 35. It's our new record. Oh, my God. I, do, I just do want to say one final thing. Millennials are going to be very key to politics in the future. I mean, they are the future. There are children that many of them are raising you know, and I'm not talking about the idiots that, you know, immerse their head into reality TV and don't give a shit about politics, but there's a, as we saw in the Ron Paul era, a huge swath of the American youth that actually give a shit. Holy mm -hmm. crap, I'm in debt. My dollar doesn't buy as much as it did two years ago, six months ago, five years ago. And, and they're now working and paying taxes and getting immersed into politics. And they are going to be so key. One thing that they do not like is bullshit. Tell them what you're getting and go from there. And I think so many that fell in love with Barack Obama are so jaded now that if you want to go forward and actually have a political campaign that remains relevant, you've got to realize that. And you've got to say things that, and that's why Ron Paul was so effective and so powerful in, in so many ways. Like, to give you an example, uh, this wasn't even reported in the media. In Dallas, Texas, it was actually Fort Worth, he had an event, and it was the first time I ever saw him speak. And there was not a single media person there. The mm -hmm. house was so packed with people from the back of the room that they had to take external speakers in Will Rogers Auditorium outside and the doors were open to literally let people who couldn't fit into the auditorium hear what he was saying. And people were shouting treason. <laughs> These are professionals, people in flip-flops and shorts. I mean, literally any demographic and age group, it was such a wide range. And these are people that came to this event 
for free to listen to him talk. And their main issue were things like the NDAA, the police state, criminalization, all of that stuff. Like there was not a single media person there, but there was a passion and energy in that room. That doesn't go away. And I don't think Rand Paul is capable of capitalizing on that because he is playing the game and they love that rebel. But you've got to capture a little bit of that real talk. And I don't think that real talking, I mean, I honestly could never go into politics because I don't, I am not a bullshit artist. I'm a business Same, woman. same here. Yeah. Can't I, bullshit. Can't do it. I do business and I build trust with people because I'm honest with them. And that honesty is currency. And that currency does matter to millennials. They don't want to be sold to with marketing gimmicks. They want to know exactly what they're getting into. And that's really, really important. And I think regardless of what happens with his campaign, um, getting back to your original question and like the whole theme of this last, you know, 10 minutes of ranting here with everybody, um, you really have to do things differently than they've always been done. Otherwise, we're a constant, stagnant cycle of an echo chamber of bullshit. And yeah. people tired of that. And Barack Obama used up all his leverage on that one. I mean, people have been bullshitted for, you know, eight years consistently now. And they were bullshitted during the Bush administration. There's a lot of partisan politics, but this younger generation is less invested and they're more independent. And the way you capture that independence audience is by being honest. There's really no other way, as much as you can, at least. So this is driving like a possibly wine fueled train of thought for me. Um, so, like, I'm thinking about how millennials, like, we, we really are, like, kind of less invested. Like, we, we don't care as much. We have more important things that we're paying attention to. And I think for so long, politics has been, like, one of the primary forms of entertainment in, like, people's lives. Um, and I think as we, as we offer more options, more forms of entertainment even, and just, like, more ways of living life that don't involve the state. Right. Um, people are going to give fewer fucks, <laughs> basically. And I'm really interested to see, okay, like, millennials are cool and everything. Millennial. But I, I want to see what's going to happen with Gen Z. Like, Is that what we're doing next? Generation Z? That's very Yes, Gen Z is next. So Gen Z, Gen Z is a little scary, though. Like, if you go on Tumblr, they're a little scary. <laughs> But also, they don't care about politics. That's nice. I like that. They care that's about cool. some really frightening forms of feminism, but that's about they, it. That's true. Sometimes <laughs> that's a parody on Tumblr, but not always. Like, really, really oh, crazy. Sometimes they're <laughs> real serious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is madness. Um, <laughs> I think, I think we got to wrap it up. Um, yeah. Don't, I mean, don't we? Because Joe needs to go to the do. gym. Not anymore. Oh. <laughs> We really, we really do need to wrap it up because I promise you no one, unless no, they're crazy. No one so will watch this. Who, whoever is so watching, long. like, up to this point, if you're watching the recording, you're probably crazy. You should go <laughs> to a doctor or something. I don't wow. know. Do. Wow, man. <laughs> you're just shooting the product in the foot even more than I, I am. I am. I'm hey, like, sure. I think we're pretty fucking awesome, okay? <laughs> we are. We are, but I'm just saying. Sam's watching I this. We just need a more interactive platform. We need to we get a so that people can interact. I mean, Ryan could have got on 30 minutes ago before we started yeah. you know, <laughs> our, our tangent. See, so. that sound is why I was meeting you, Ryan, not because I'm trolling you or anything. <laughs> That's nope, why. No, nope, please don't. <laughs> All right. This is always true. It's true forever. <laughs> Ryan, I'm going to send you away now. on Twitter. Okay. Thank you for joining, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, when are you guys doing this again? Uh, uh, Tuesday. We, yes, we will be doing a Bourbon and Bitches Tuesday. It won't be a Bourbon for Bitches who hate politics, but I don't know that there's a huge difference. <laughs> I don't know. Hard to say. All right, Ryan, I'm saying way now, but thanks for coming. Yes, Bye. thank you. Right. Appreciate it. Fair enough. Fun. Oh, man, this has been quite a journey, you guys. Um, <laughs> all right. Is there any way? All right. Well, the thing that I that was not politics that I was enjoying before this heartening conversation was I was rewatching a lot of Doctor Who, and that made my my sad feelings feel less. My feelsies. <laughs> so that's my, good. 
my go-to is the eleventh hour. Like I cannot tell you how many times I've watched that stupid episode. Really? <laughs> yes. See, I, I, I never rewatched the Matt Smith era except oh, uh, except the first um, Neil Gaiman episode where the TARDIS becomes a woman because that's awesome. Yeah. That yeah. was really good. Because because <laughs> Neil Gaiman, right? Yeah, right. No, it's true. <laughs> uh, Joe, tell us quickly. What you've been about doing. What, I've, what I've been enjoying? Yeah. <laughs> uh, not okay. yet. Okay. You know uh, what, Joe? <sighs> <laughs> I've been. I started Winston Churchill biography. He yeah. was a bad man, but he was very smart. So that's. To bring about to you know, he was a guy who loved his big speeches in front of, you know, Parliament. I, I did like him in Doctor Who. Like, he was, he was okay-ish <laughs> uh, in Doctor Who. That episode's Who. terrible, Meg. That episode's <laughs> he was, so he bad. He was okay-ish. So, uh, so my husband is entertaining. Yeah. My husband is a uh, descendant of Winston Churchill, and uh, so we can make fun of him right now. That's good. <laughs> what, what have you, tell me one thing you've enjoyed in the past week that's not related to politics. One thing I've enjoyed. Oh, wait. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's censored. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, no, e experiencing a shit ton of positivity and really getting exposed to awesome circles of people that are looking to innovate and to really change the world in very different ways. I've been researching tech companies for Coin Congress in Amsterdam, which is going to be an international series of conferences all over the world. They had their first one in San Francisco and Singapore last year in coordination with the uh, uh, Bitcoin Foundation. And this year they're branching out again and doing Amsterdam, Singapore, Hong Kong, everywhere pretty much. And what they're trying to do is create Dubai, this like... Tel Aviv. Yeah, Tel Aviv. <laughs> There's a ton of places. D uh, Dubai. Like they're trying to go to all these places and actually create like an event experience for not just cryptocurrency but all innovative and disruptive tech. So I've been Sounds researching good. all of these awesome organizations and companies that are small and undiscovered, and even there's this new gadget that you put behind the small of your back that you can barely feel that texts you on your phone when you're slouching because you need to straighten out. Like Wait, I need that. I need that in it's my mom life. It's mom because app. people work on computers so much. Like, there's another one, too, that's like a little uh, band on your wrist for carpal tunnel when you're angling your wrist the wrong way or you're not using like ergonomic strategies to type and to do your work. It will actually alert you through your phone or a desktop notification that you're out of posture sync. Like, that type of stuff. Stay up straighter now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> She's like, what up? <laughs> yeah, look at me now. Look at my yeah, posture. Yeah, you know, what Solid. up? <laughs> Solid stuff. <laughs> Everybody's sitting up straighter. <laughs> yep. But yeah, I mean that from like virtual reality to all of these really cool concepts that no one's talking about and there's a ton of them out there. So that really gives me a lot of hope. It shows me there's innovation and there's a lot of market driven activity that people are engaging in. Balls to the wall, freewheeling, getting the product out there and that is very inspiring to me. So I didn't really, I wasn't exposed to that like super high tech um, integration of you know, the human experience and your work life and biohacking and all that other stuff beyond a cursory understanding. And this right. last week, I've really gotten super deep into it, and it's pretty freaking awesome. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I've enjoyed this week. All right. Finally, let's end with some good old-fashioned pitching of anything we do. I have had some writer's blocky bad weeks for writing, but in general, you can see me at Vice and Rare, hopefully, and Anti-War, and the Stag Blog, and Twitter, see if I embarrass myself again there. Be, <laughs> that's a good reason to follow me. Um, and obviously, Bourbon and Bitches is on Tuesdays at 10 Eastern Time. Oh, and yeah. You I, all I, should turn into that. <laughs> tune into that. Um, I, anyway, Meg, where should the people go on the internet in general? Um, something. Um, well, people should find Voice and Exit on Facebook and Twitter, and we're about to launch a brand new schmancy website with a new blog, and we're going to be releasing videos from 2014. Um, and for those who are not familiar with Voice and Exit, it is a super cool, and I'm saying this as someone who hasn't actually been yet because I was an absolute <laughs> idiot and didn't go last year. Like, I knew about it, my husband wanted to go, and we didn't go. So much regret. Um, anyway, 
it is this really cool event experience. It's like a festival of the future. So we have like short TED style talks. So it's like 20 some minutes. You're not going to like check out and get bored like you will when watching this podcast. <laughs> Damn it. I'm a hater. I'm a hater. Um, <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed participating in this. Um, and then there are breakout sessions and a huge like party of the future at the end. Anyway, it's super, super cool. I'm assuming from the videos that I've watched. Um, and uh, people should find Voice and Exit, and then they should go on Austin, uh, June 20th through 21st, 2015. Um, let's see, what else should I plug? I should plug things. <laughs> Tiffany and I and some other people are starting a business consulting firm called Creative Destructors. That's a great like name. Economics. We like That's economics. Awesome That's awesome name. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate I appreciate the nerd in you that gets that. Oh yeah. No doubt. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so those are the things I'm gonna plug. Oh, and just because I'm really enjoying them, Startup Podcast and Reply All by Gimlet Media, they're they're just amazing, and you should listen to them. Sounds good, Joe. <laughs> what you want to plug something? Um, in the world. I mean, eventually, my band's gonna be doing uh, the Coffee House on WDVE. Really? Yes. That's legit. Yeah, so that'll be fun. I don't know when, eventually. Just okay. like eventually okay. I'll block something. Just that. <laughs> What's your band name? Uh, Act of Pardon. That's a terrible name. It's fine. Um, <laughs> eventually, I like it. eventually I'll write something for the stag blog. But you will. I uh, believe in you. Allegedly I will. Well, if Afterborn if After needs any help with their website or their social media, you've got your uh, your girls here that'll give you a sweet discount because we like yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> well, See? I built the website, so. That's <laughs> good. Get out there. I'm, yeah. in the, I'm in the same. I'm You're sorted. No, I'm, I'm going to build everything. Not Don't go to these ladies. <laughs> Well, on that Ooh. note. Okay, can we can we mute him now? <laughs> Just kidding, Joe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it properly now. Audience who stuck through this even partially, but especially <laughs> if you ever watch the whole damn thing, you're amazing. Um, thanks to Ryan for awkwardly hanging out with us, even though he was loud when he shifted in his chair. That's okay. I wasn't trolling him. Thanks very much to the spontaneous Jeffrey Tucker guest, which is the best kind of Jeffrey Tucker guest. And thanks to Joe, the honorary bitch, and Meg and Tiffany, the standby bitches. Yeah. Ever stalwart bitches, as um, <laughs> Matt Damon says in True Grit. He didn't say the bitches part. All right, this has been Bourbon for Politics Who Bitches Hate, or something like that. Um, tune in Tuesday nights to Bourbon and Bitches, 10 Eastern Time, and tune in to Politics for People Who Hate Politics, ideally, at 8 p.m. on Thursdays, Eastern Time. Um, or just when it happens. Well, shh, no, we're being, we're being, we're being, <laughs> being, being consistent here. And the next one might be about aliens and have nothing to do with politics, which is Wait, a can, platonic can I, ideal of... Can I please be on that one, please? Yes, you can. I have, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings surrounding aliens. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm going to... I mean, I'm, this no. is a B&B uh, task, too. Come on, this is a really good subject. All right, well, we're going to do aliens, and if anyone is welcome to join in the alien talk, but I'm going to end this... <laughs> Wait, God wait. Forsaken broadcast, you'll still be here. We'll talk about it. No, you. this is really important. This is really important. I have one conspiracy theory which I completely believe, and that is that Elon Musk is an alien. So I think we're going to that in the future. <laughs> All right, tune in next Thursday when hopefully we explore that further. Thanks for watching. If you watched, can I help you? Bye. Cheers.